Chapter 4. Perspective. I don't know why it took an interest in you, but I'd be careful. It's never helped anyone before. Stupid. A blast of lightning fired past me, shattering an old clock at the back of the overview office I was cowering in. The Wageland Survival Guide was full of all sorts of useful tips. Scavenging guides, a whole chapter on mines, and more. And then, there were the not-so-helpful ones. After having read the chapter on making pre-war pre earth pony technology work for you, my first thought when I came across the ruins of iron-shod firearms was to take a peek inside and see if there was any technology I could make work for me. Instead, I got trapped in a maze full of ponocidal robots and automated turrets, fleeing until I managed to back myself into a corner here, in an office box high above the factory floor, almost out of ammo. If I hadn't found that medical box in the employee bathroom, I would have died trying to get across the second floor. How could I possibly have been so very stupid? Below, three of those robots were rolling about, looking for me. They were tracking things, built to somewhat resemble ponies, with clear domed heads that housed real brains. I refused to think that the ponies who built them might have used other ponies' brains in the construction. The thought was just too horrible. Even doing that to an animal's brain was awful. And clearly, 200 years of continuous obduration had only done nothing for their sanity. Come out! We only want to kill you for trespassing. Case in point. The fact that the voice sounded like a young filly, despite being clearly artificial, made them sound much freakier. Fortunately, the railings on the catwalks leading up to the office were too narrow for those brain bots to get up here. Much deeper, authoritative voice boomed across the room. Surrender in the name of the Ministry of Technology, zebra scum. I cringed behind a line of metal filing cabinets as the room filled with a rush of fire. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for the other type of guard robot I'd come across in the path here. Those multi-limbed things looked like giant metal spiders. Many of its arms seemed to end in weapons, including a bizarre flamethrower and buzzsaw. And worse, the damn things could fly. I slipped both my grenades out of my saddlebags and waited until the flames died down. The metal filing cabinets were beginning to get unpleasantly warm against my back, and the heat in the air seared my lungs. The second the flamethrower was cut off, I turned around and levitated them both right up to the metal monster, pulling out the stems on the way. The moment it saw me, the robot raised a pulsating green weapon that looked like a unicorn's horn. Elching fire erupt from it, shooting past me, close enough to singe my cheek. And the blast struck an old fan sitting on the desk right behind me, and it glowed green for a moment, and then melted. I ducked back as I dropped the grenades. The explosion rocked the office. I heard a fearsome twang as part of the catwalk outside gave. Looking back, the robot was in a non-functional heap, and the walkway outside was mostly intact, but badly sagging. I wasn't sure that it could hold my weight. Stripping what I could from the spider bot, I considered my options. I couldn't stay up here forever, and if I moved very fast, I could run the walkway without the brain bots below getting me. Their weaponry did not seem very accurate, but the first few yards of the catwalk had partially torn free and sagged alarmingly. The more I look at it, the less I wanted to put a hoof on it. I never tried levitating myself before. In theory, it should work, but I'd never seen a pony do it. 
Focusing, I tried. I could feel the glow of my horn stretch out and envelop my entire body. Brighter, it glowed as I tried to lift myself. I was shining like a dozen lanterns when I felt my body lift, just slightly, from the ground. I was sweating. This was as far as I could go, but I was doing it. Now, one step forward, and another, and another. I was halfway across when the brain bot started firing lightning in my general direction. One of the bolts struck the catwalk, arcing along it. I felt very lucky I wasn't actually touching it, but I was almost spent. Ahead of me, the catwalk stopped right before the huge windows that let twice firing sun, twice filtered sunlight, once by the clouds and once by the dirty glass itself, into the factory floor, supplementing the light from heavy fixtures hanging above me. The catwalk shot off in both directions, running parallel to the wall. One was the direction I had come from, and the other led to a door which had been locked. Only that door didn't have a lock to pick. Instead, it could only be operated from a command from the terminal. Another shot of lightning missed cleanly, shooting through one of the shattered windows of the observation office and fraying the terminal I had just used not five minutes ago to unlock said door. It was a lot of metal catwalk, but the damn bots beneath me shot lightning. I grunted in the effort th that kept me aloft, feeling my vision darken at the edges. I had to stop, or I'd pass out, and that would be the end of me. Releasing the magic, I dropped onto the couch walk. It wavered, but held. I let go of a breath I didn't realize I was holding, and started to gallop. Don't run! We want to be your friend! More blasts. I tensed, expecting to feel paralyzing electricity rip through my body, starting at my hooves. Instead, I heard a crash, a loud pop, and a twang from somewhere else. Looking up as I ran, I realized that one of the bolts had hit the hanging lamp above, causing it to softly buzz and explode. And that, freakishly, was the last straw. It snapped loose from the badly aged, cracked ceiling above and swung down, crashing into this catwalk beside me. The whole walkway shook, and then the section behind me tore away with a rendering scream of abused metal. Oh, fuck me with Celestia's four hooves. I'll admit my repertoire of colorful descriptions had grown more profane with my experience from the Raiders. But as I galloped down the walkways, my heart tearing sp at heart tearing speed, trying to keep ahead of the sections of catwalk that began to fall onto the factory floor like a thunderous, lethal game of dominoes, I felt sentiment entirely appropriate. I was almost to the door when the metal catwalk dropped out from under me, and I threw myself forward, carried on only by momentum, and caught the final section with only my forelegs. I hung there, my hind hooves dangling several stories over the ancient rifle assembly line that had been crushed by the fallen catwalk. I struggled, trying to inch myself up. I used my magic to try and tug on my saddlebags and drag myself forward. My heart was pounding. I fought to keep visions of falling from dominating my imagination. I tried to not think of my back breaking as I landed on the conveyor belt below. The least, at least the damned brain robots weren't shooting at me anymore, having scurried for cover. It seemed to take forever, but inch by inch, I pulled myself onto the final section of catwalk. It wobbled threateningly beneath me, sticking out from the wall like a diving board, held in place by bolts that wiggled in where widened holes. Cautiously, I got my hooves under me and stepped lightly towards the door. 
A blast of lightning hit the catwalk, shooting up my legs and sending me into painful convulsions. I collapsed, shaking, on the walkway, my mane and tail hairs standing on end. The walkway responded with a metallic cry and tilted several inches, threatening to dump me into the gulf below. I staggered shakily to my feet, and another blast shot up from almost directly beneath me, missing the catwalk by less than a foot and striking the ceiling above. Bits of singed plaster rained down. I gave the door a push, and was vastly relieved when it swung open, and then the catwalk gave further. It lurched, and I lunged and wrapped my foreleg four legs around the door frame to keep from sliding down the now quite steep metal platform. A third electrical blast ripped through the air, striking another strip of industrial lighting, whose light also exploding, making it swing perilously. Grunting, I pulled myself into the room, and I turned and sat in the doorway, looking down at the brain bots rolling in circles directly below, trying to figure out how to get to me. Then, with a strong kick of my forelegs, I knocked down the last bit of catwalk loose, and it fell, scraping down the wall, till it smashed through the robot's brain case, pulping the organ inside and continuing down, ripping the machine roughly in half. I must admit, I found the crunch immensely satisfying. I realized that the room I had successfully addressed at such great personal risk had not offered another way out. I would have been in deep trouble. Closing the door behind me, I fell immediately, felt immediately more comfortable. The room had been painted in what had once been a bright orange, and the paint had not lost all of its warmth over time. The wood paneling probably brought a pleasant, homey feel to what I believe was clearly the factory overmare's office. Now that the wood was rotted and crumbling, on the back wall above the desk was an oversized logo in deeply tarnished bronze. Ironshod firearms. How do you like them apples? I don't get it. Ignoring it, I looked around. A large fancy desk, chair, filing cabinets, a poster in a black lit flame frame. The same poster I had seen several times in the factory, but this one in better condition, showing graceful pegasi ponies soaring through the sky, rainbows exploding behind them as they shot down on dark demonic striped figures with evil glowing eyes. Better whipped than stripped. Join the equestrian forces today. And a wardrobe. My eyes barely touched these. Moving to the important things first. The office held a terminal I could hack, a wall safe I could pick, and a personal elevator that, if it worked, would get me safely to the first floor and out of this death trap. There was an ammo box under the desk. And then my eyes fell on something unique. Mounted opposite was a glass case. And in the case was a beautiful and perfectly preserved revolver. A similar model to mine, but crafted with what I've much, much have approached love. It had a scope and an ivory bit molded for extra comfortable fit in the mouth and ease of trigger. On the handle was an emblem. Three apples. I tried my hoof, so to speak, at the safe first. It was tough, taking a few attempts, but after breaking one body pin, I learned better how to further present losses. The safe opened with a generous click. The impressive amount of objects made me wonder if my excursion to iron shod firearms hadn't been worthwhile after all. I started sorting the treasure from the rubbish. Inside was a sack full of pre-war coins, a copy of Equestrian Army Today, 
and a whole bunch of finance papers that ceased to mean anything hundreds of years ago, and a box of what looked like bubble gum. I couldn't decipher the writing on it. And a spark of spark o magic battery. And finally, an odd hoof strapped arcanotech device that looked like it was meant to interface with my pit buck. Curiously, I slid it on and let my pit buck analyze it. Stealth buck. Invisibility spell. One charge. Hot damn! Next was that terminal. Pulling out my utility suit, I slid out my access tool and started to work. This terminal was tougher to crack than the previous ones, even with my tools, and I had to abort several times to avoid getting locked out. I pulled another apple from my bag and bit into it, intent on the screen, only to hit something painfully hard. Levitating the apple to my eye level, I saw a bullet embedded in it. Looking down at my saddlebag, in, there was indeed a small hole, although it looked, it took me a few minutes to remember what had happened. Once in, I discovered a whole mess of old notes and messages. In addition, the terminal had a shutdown key for all the robotic security, and it could remotely open both the safe and the display, display case. I rolled my eyes, thanking the universe ever so much for giving me this potentially life-saving option, only now that I'd already fought my way up to finish and no longer needed it. I also realized that I could have saved myself a bobby pin if I had worked on the computer first. I told the terminal to open the display case, and doing so triggered a message. Cousin Brayburn, I know we ain't talked in some time, but the war effort's taken a twist for scary and I might not have a chance to see you again. I want to man fences. Now, I ain't gonna muck up with words. We all know how well that went last time. Instead, I'm sending you a little Macintosh as a gift and as an apology. To show you I'm sincere, keep them safe for me, will ya? The accent was very much like that of the voice I found on Velvet Remedy's pit buck, although this time it was clearly not from the same pony. But it was the earnest tone of the recording that made me pause. Two hundred years ago, some pony had given this gun as a token of apology and as an effort to connect the family. With that, some pony's cousin had done just as she asked preserving the weapon for generations after his own death. I wasn't going to leave it here, untouched by any pony, until the building collapsed upon it. But when I took it, I removed it respectfully. And what was left, all that was left was going to check the rest of the office. The ammo box held bullets for little Macintosh, and not a shy amount. In the wardrobe, I found some old maintenance suit that I could repair the holes in my own utility barding, and some other garments that I left behind. Eventually, I turned to the elevator and pushed the button. Nothing. Of course it didn't work. The wasteland just couldn't give me a break. Pulling out my tools, I opened the side panel and tried to figure out what was wrong and if I could fix it from here. To my great relief, I could. The elevator proved to be an impressive condition, particularly considering the rest of the building. But the battery for the interface was dead, and Celestia's mercy would have it. There was a replacement in the safe. One swapping of batteries later, and I was on my way. As the door slid shut, a thought crossed my mind. Macintosh, wasn't that... I trotted between the collapsed buildings that littered the area around Iron Shed Firearms, not having any particular direction to go. Aimless. I hadn't found any sign of civilization. Civilized civilization, mind you. I had kind of given up on finding Velvet Remedy. For now, 
I was satisfying myself with random exploration, although that had just proven exceptionally dangerous. In Stable 2, I knew exactly what my future would be, as unbearably dull as it would have been. And out here, in the huge open outside, I was struggling with just the opposite. I never considered that having an assigned place might be as much of a relief as it was a burden. My ears perked up at the sound of overwrought, triumphant music. I watched as a sprite bot fluttered down a cross street, and running up to it, I drew myself around in front of it. Watcher? It just floated by. I dashed in front of it again. Hello? The music just kept playing. I waved a hoof right in front of its face, and it danced around me and kept going. Well, that was helpful. I picked a random direction and started trotting again. I thought of Watcher's advice. Armor, check. Weapon, double check. Guidance? I looked back at Iron Shed building. A bit iffy, but check. Friends? It's kinda hard to make friends, where there doesn't seem to be any pony around. My exasperated voice echoed off crumbling walls of concrete. If this was a quest, it was a lame one. I seriously needed to find something to do. Preferably other than dodge and duck in Stable 2. I felt plainfully ordinary. I yearned to be special. Now, I yearned to be anything. My downcast eyes chanced upon a red rider scooter amidst the ruins. Reaching out a hoof, I flipped it back onto its wheels and prodded it back and forth a few times. Three of the wheels were locked with rust, but to my surprise, one still turned. And looking up, I found myself at the edge of a playground. The swings and outside and slide jutted out into the oddly colored air, blackened by ancient spellfire like bones of a giant dead beast. The merry-go-round was warped and canted. The skeletons of a baby pony was still curled up at one end. Sadness and immense shame flooded me. I had been feeling sorry for myself. In the midst of all this, another tiny skeleton lay against the burnt husk of a tree three roller skates in the dirt, near its hooves. The fourth? I doubted anyone would ever know. I plodded on, moving through the silent, impromptu graveyard. <clears throat> At the far, far end, sheltered by walls that were mostly still intact, I found an old vending machine. Sparkle Cola, the machine still advertised, through the years of grime. It featured a backlit emblem of stylized carrots. Surprisingly, the machine still looked functional. Fishing out a few pre-war coins, I fed them into the machine. I didn't actually expect that it would still have soda after all these years, but I was astonished when a bottle rolled out ditifully. I suddenly realized how awfully thirsty I was. The Sparkle Cola was lukewarm, but actually rather delicious, with a delightful carroty aftertaste. The clink, uh, clicking of my pip buck warmed me that I was ingesting trace amounts of radiation with each swallow, but not enough to be harmful. I'd taken more harm standing around at Sweet Apple Acres, and besides, if it reached the point where my radiation intake began to make me sick, I just had I had a couple of Rataway potions. The only supplies from the iron shod medical box that I hadn't needed to use just to survive in the building. I spotted a bench just about the, the size of the building around the side of the building and decided to take a load off my legs. Possibly read some of the Equestrian Army Today book that I had picked up. As I turned the corner 
My gaze fell on an old, torn poster affixed to the wall. The image was of a face of an elderly pony, almost obstructively pink coordination, coloration. Her mane was streaked with gray. On some ponies, gray hair makes them look distinguished, but on most, it makes them look old. Hers made her look like a candy cane. Her eyes were huge and staring. I could swear, poster or not, that she was looking right into me. Some pony had ripped the poster right through the middle, and I had no idea what her expression was supposed to be. But I couldn't help but feel like I was doing something wrong. Bold words, above and below the image, now deeply faded, announced, Pinkie Pie is watching you forever. There were additional words, very tiny, beneath, so small and faded, but I had to lean close and strain to read them. A happy reminder from the Ministry of Morale. I stepped back, tilting my head as I looked at the poster again. What's the Ministry of Morale? Watcher's voice erupted from over my shoulder, making me jump high enough my horn whacked the ceiling. Another well-meaning idea that was so much better on scroll. I gasped, willing my heart to beat regularly again, and feeling a fleet, fleeting empathy that's with sawn off. The sprite bot was hovering right next to me. Celestia, those things were silent when they weren't playing music. Are you trying to give me a heart attack? Oh, sorry. I gave the flying orb a glare. I forgot about the bench and started walking, trying to enjoy the rest of my sparkle cola. And the sprite bot followed. I see you've got some armor. The mechanical voice seemed hesitant. I didn't ask why. Watcher either didn't care enough to explain, or thought better of it. Maybe the fact that I was walking through the equestrian wasteland in an outfit coated inside and out with dried blood gave it pause. I could only go up to any stable pony and go, I'm evil, bad, nightmare pony, ah! And even, despite my size, they would take one look and flee. I sipped my cola and watched, wished desperately for someplace decent to bathe. The problem was, any water clean and radiation free enough to take a bath in would be too precious to pollute. One of my canteens was empty, and the second nearly so. Maybe the reason you're having trouble finding your place is that you haven't discovered your virtue yet. Watcher offered out of thin air. I stopped. What? How did you know? Oh, never mind. Then, what do you mean, my virtue? Well, the flying ball began, the greatest heroes of Equestria, ponies with lifelong bonds of unbreakable friendship and strength, were each known by an exemplifying one of great virtues of pony kind. Kindness, honesty, laughter. Laughter is a virtue? I asked, doubtfully. Roll with me on this, the Sprybot continued, without breaking stride. Generosity, loyalty, and magic. They really didn't know themselves, or each other, until one pony came to realize that her friends represented these virtues, and together they grew to live by them. Now, I'm not saying that those are the only virtues, they are just, uh... Neldabot paused, as if searching for words, particularly important set. I'm just saying that perhaps if you learn to recognize the dominant virtue in your own heart, you will find yourself, and you won't need any more or anything else to tell you your place in the... The watcher's voice cut out with an abrupt, abrupt pop, and music began playing once more. Brilliant. I watched as the sprite bot slowly sailed away. 
Well, if that wasn't a load of pony pies, I don't know what was. Finishing my soda, I tossed the empty can amidst a pile of others. Empty bottles littered the equestrian wasteland, like weeds. A thought was occurring to me about Watcher, the Wasteland Survival Guide, had been written after the Mega Spells rained down. Long after, considering its sounding device and scavenging. So the book hadn't been in Ponyville Library as part of the original pre war library. It found its way there later. From the lack of being burned, defaced, or covered in blood. I was guessing recently, which made me wonder. Did Watcher know about those poor ponies the raiders held captive? And if so, is that why I was talked into going there? Was I manipulated into walking into that horror because Watcher hoped I would free them? I couldn't be sure, and I considered that Watcher saved me. I should give him the benefit of the doubt. But I couldn't help the niggling sense that Watcher was playing me. And I don't like being tricked. My ears perked as the music stopped again, replaced by a voice. But this wasn't Watcher's voice. This was some pony else. This voice wasn't metallic. It was the voice of a smooth male pony with greasy charisma. Friends, ponies, rejoice! Although the world about you is bleak, scared, and poisoned by war and horrorlessness, and honorlessness, thoughtlessness, inferior ponies of the past, we do not have to live in a world of shadows of their greed and wickedness. Together, we can rise Equestria back to its former beauty. Together, we can build a new kingdom where all live in perfect utility. It's already happening, my good ponies. Already. The foundation for a new and wonderful age is being built. Yes, it's hard work. But don't we owe it to ourselves and future generations of ponies to be better? No, to be the best we can possibly be. I'm telling you now, as your friend, as your leader, that we can, we must, and we will. What in a fever dream was that? The music had resumed, not popping back in the middle of the song, like when Watcher seized control of the sprite bot, but at the beginning of a new song, like this was how the bot was supposed to work. Wait, ponies have a leader now? That was serious news to me. As far as I could see, we didn't even have a country. Hell, I'd settle for a town, even a few shacks built within vague proximity of each other, as long as they had ponies living there in peace or as close to peace as the wasteland allowed. If we had a leader, we had to have at least one town, right? Trotting faster now, I found a ruin with enough intact stairs to let me get up to what I thought was a second floor, and brought out the binoculars and looked around. Sure enough, in the distance, I saw smoke. Enough plumes close enough together to suggest some sort of settlement. I prayed to Celestia that the smoke was from cooking fires, and not from raiders burning it to the ground. There was a path leading towards the settlement that would keep me from losing my way, and there was moving, movement on that path. My horn glowed as I focused the binoculars, bringing a small group of ponies into view. Two of them were pulling a heavy laden wagon, a young pony rode on his back, apparently talking with two others who were guided, equally burdened, two-headed beasts. The group was headed towards me, away from the theoretical town, but they didn't look like they were fleeing, and none of them were wounded. All of which was a good sign. A very good sign indeed. I looked up into the thick, broiling crowd, clouds, toward the disk of the sun made a brighter spot in the cloudy ceiling, and sent a prayer of thanks to Celestia. 
The path wasn't a road, exactly. Rather, it was a long, arching swathe cut through the equestrian wasteland. Two parallel metal lines, reinforced, with badly aged crossed planks of wood. Half an hour back, it had crossed over a gully on a rickety bridge. After my fun with catwalks, I chose to brave the gully rather than put my hooves on something else that would surely hold off its inevitable collapse until it could take me with it. It turned out to be a good decision. Despite the wounds, the gully had been home to a bunch of large, bloated pig things with extremely nasty front teeth. One of them had gotten a hold of my hind leg, but I didn't clean through my armor and cutting a deep gash. Little Macintosh is neither quiet nor subtle. In a single shot from that sweaty, sweet little gun, tore the head clean off the pig thing attacking me. And it fires quickly enough that I was able to slay three others before my targeting spell ran out. Beneath the bridge was Subpony's camp, and it had a long abandoned field to it. But there were scattered supplies, including a few cases of shotgun ammo and a single can of food amidst a litter of tin cans. Magical fruit was labeled, but it turned out to be just beans, and a locked medical box. I picked the lock easily, finding a healing potion, which I swiftly drank. Breathing a sigh of relief as the nasty gash rended gently and the pain ebbed away. There were magical bandages, nowhere near as powerful as a potion, but good for flesh wounds, and a box of... mints? Mint owls. Refresh your mind and your breath. I had been surprised to see a smiling zebra on the front of the box. In the first depiction of a zebra I'd seen that didn't look like a storybook villain. Now, I figured it was over halfway to the settlement, maybe two thirds. I tried to keep my mind from imagining what I would find. A whole city of civilized and happy ponies, maybe. I didn't want to set myself up for another letdown. Even a few shacks, I told myself. I picked up the last, picked up the pace of my trot. I heard a gunshot in the same instant that I felt a bullet tear clean through my right hind leg, and another clang of the metal casing of the sniper rifle strapped to my back. I screamed in agony and collapsed to a skittish halt on the rocky ground, clenching at my hind leg. It was bleeding profusely through the hole torn through it, and a bullet missing the bone, and I could tell that sickingly because I could see it. I tossed my head back and screamed again. Desperately, I dragged myself around a large mound of rocks, trying to take shelter from a shooter I never saw. Focusing as much as I could through the terrible pain, I pulled the magic laced bandages from around my neck. I tried wrapping my bleeding hind leg, but the bandages were meant for cuts and gashes, not gaping holes. It was soaked with blood and sliding off almost before I had finished wrapping it. I tossed the bandages and tried again, this time pulling the bandages much tighter. It too soaked bright, wet, bright red, but at least it stayed. Shaking with fear and pain, knowing from the sudden chills that my body was going into shock, I looked up and tried to spy the pony who attacked me. I looked all around, but no one was there, and there wasn't a whole lot of cover to be hiding in. These hills of dirt and rock were mostly barren. I felt like my heart swallowed an ice cube when the image hit me that there was a pony out there with a stealth buck. She could be right next to me, pointing her gun at my head, and I wouldn't even know. But then I looked upward, and there was, in the sky, a rust-coated pegasus pony with an orange mane under a black desperado hat, and what looked like two rifles, 
one strapped beneath each wing. The pony had finished circling back around and was aiming right at me. With panic intact, with panic instinctively kicking off, I levitated a large rock in front of my face as a shield. A clang rang through the air, and the two rifles smot fired simultaneously. The first bullet struck the rock, sending chips of stone flying and ricocheted, lodging in my canteen. The last of my water burbled out of my hooves. The second punched through my armor and embedded itself in my left shoulder, sending me reeling. Again, I collapsed, the pain peaking and then beginning to bleed off, which I knew wasn't a good sign. This time, I don't think I would be getting back up again. So, is this what it's like to die? So overrated. My eyes felt heavy, and I closed them. I don't think for long, but when I opened them again, I spotted the ponies drawing their wagon coming over the hill. Behind them would be more ponies, guiding pack, two-headed cattle things, and I remember the young pony in the back of the wagon. I doubted any of them would look up. Forcing myself to my hooves, I began dragging myself into the open. If I was going to die, I wasn't going to lay down and watch these people get slaughtered. My body screamed agony into my head, but I kept going, marching myself on lame legs until I was standing right in the path of the approaching group. Turning and focusing through the hammering in my head, I lifted little Macintosh into the air and pointed it at the rust-colored Pegasus, who had whipped back around and was flying right at me again. I stood directly between them and the travelers. My vision was blurry from tears and trauma, and I wasn't sure, even with sats, that I could hit him. And I stood no chance against his aim. He was an amazing shot, technically. He hadn't missed me yet. Putting every ounce of me into it, I growled as menacingly as I could, and hoped that a pony who had survived four shots wouldn't be mistaken for a pony to be reckoned with. Shoot at me if you want, but if you attack that family, I will end you. To my surprise, the Pegasus' eyes widened, and instead of firing, he backflapped his wings, coming to a halt in front of me. Whoa, Nelly! Levitating little Macintosh was getting really hard, and I'd lost all feeling in, in my shot leg and fell to my haunches without realizing. I ain't the one attacking that caravan. You are. What? Black was seeping into my vision from all sides. My head was swimming. The conversation wasn't making any sense, but at least he was conversing rather than killing me. Weakly, not attacking. You shot me. Well, of course I shot you. I see a raider heading to, head in a caravan. I'm gonna pre perforate her till she ain't moving no more. The rust-colored pony glared at me. And then, with a strangely proud work, it's my policy. I felt my forelegs begin to give. I was near collapse, but the wounds, words of the pony caused a fire to flash in my head. Little Macintosh had begun to sink towards the ground, but now it swung back up, pointed right between my attacker's eyes. I'm not a raider. The pony point pointed at me argumentatively. You sure look like a raider. Seemingly from out of nowhere, the cold from their wagon galloped into view. I tried to raise my voice in warning, but nothing came out. The blackness fighting to overtake my vision finally won, and I collapsed, sinking into what felt like a deep sleep. The last thing I heard was the colt whining. Calamity! What have you done? Footnote. Level up. New perk. Egghead. 
you will add plus two points each time you gain a new experience level.